nothing went wrong with the recording, but like I'll let you know before I do that. Oh uh, yeah, so yeah, we'll just get into it. So you were saying when we started that you you started per, or you were personal training. Like how long ago was that, or how did you get into that? Yeah, so I opened up my business, my gym. Um, this is the UFC gym, in the UFC gym. Yeah, it was originally called the LA Boxing. Okay. So I bought a franchise from LA, LA Boxing, mm -hmm. um, probably like 14 years ago. Wow. 15 years ago, and then it took a while for us to open. Uh huh. There's a little crazy story on how that happened. Oh really? Um, yeah, I mean, I was 23 years old. Um, I was working. Wow, you were young then. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I was working. First job out of college, I was like a project engineer at, for a big construction company in Jersey City. Right. Um, wow. And then I left that to, to do like a sales job mm -hmm. with one of my best friends and his family. And I just realized I had like an 104 year old, you know, um, right. mindset. And like, that's what, just where I wanted to be. I wanted to work for myself. Yeah. And uh, I wrestled in college and I was learning, trying to learn, like, trying to box a little bit. And I was doing jujitsu at the time. Mm -hmm. And I saw a franchise called LA Boxing. Interesting. Yeah. So I was like, man, this would kill. Because like right. at the time, there was no like boxing gyms, or mm -hmm. kickboxing gyms, or like I would even say like MMA gyms at the time. There was like a few jiu-jitsu gyms around. Right. And then there was like hardcore boxing gyms like Gleason's and that type. Right. Yeah. Or there was like Thai bow classes at a regular gym. Yeah. There was like no happy medium. So when I saw LA Boxing, I was like, dope, let me go check this out. Right. So I flew out to LA. And it was like this rugged gym uh -huh. on the beach. Tito Ortiz, his boxing coach. Oh, like wow. All these professional fighters were teaching these classes, and it was all like women. Right. Like guys taking classes. So yeah. you capitalize and monetize and make money right. off everyday people. Right. Yet you could take it to like the advanced level and like actually learn how to box. Right, and right. Like real fighters. Wow. And at the time, I was like going to Gleason's to box, and it was just like tough, man. Like a lot of those trainers don't want to like feed into people that aren't. Uh, like a white kid coming in off the street, like learning how to box, like, right? These prospects, right? Yeah, the time into so, yeah, exactly. It was an awesome, happy medium. I bought the franchise rights to Hoboken, and it was an early franchise. Uh -huh. And uh, my business partner at the time, this guy I used to work with, we took out some loans, mm -hmm. we borrowed some, borrowed some money from family, and we actually um, heard of this like large investment that was taking place. Uh -huh. <laughs> And That's how all good stories start. And it turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. Oh no. And we lost like after putting after buying the franchise fake, after putting down the security deposit for our rent, which is like on the waterfront from Oh, geez. Yeah, yeah. We had like first deposit for our contractors and then no money after that. Oh, geez. We lost it all in Ponzi scheme. Oh hundred thousand dollars. Oh my god. I quit my job. So it was crazy. It was crazy, but and I can write a book on how I finally opened the gym. Right. But you should. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Other than like they borrow and see them, you know. And luckily, I didn't have to bring on any part, any other partners. And, right. And we were able to open open the doors and wow, grind it out and that's amazing. Made it, made it happen. What about like that's that's wow that's incredible. What about like the when you to lose that much money at that age, do you not have a concept of it, or do you have I a think concept? When you're of young, it and like you're just like at that age, young. I think that's the best time to try something. I agree. Like, yeah, like when you're like 23 to 27, 28, mm -hmm. like when you're before you're 30 and you have like a lot of responsibilities. Like if you have a passion, I say go for it. Yeah, and, and I feel like if there is something inside of you that fires you to be like I want to do this, right? That's one thing. But if you're like I need to do this, like this is me, like. Mm -hmm do it because you, you'll make it successful because you'll put your heart into it right and so I knew like once the doors open it was gonna be fine right so it's just getting there yeah yeah so there was like a hard like eight months to a year to like come up with the money to like hold off on like coming up with some schemes and yeah, yeah. Things, like <laughs> to push the rent back even further right right you know, without telling them we're broke you know? yeah so, yeah of course wow so, yeah. that's incredible so did you did you have any background at that point in personal training or you had I you was, were just like I'm gonna get I was um, a wrestler in college, I was mm -hmm. doing jiu-jitsu, I was boxing. Um, no like, you know, sales experience and I, I was like my first job I kinda got thrown into the fire where I was, you know, project engineer, like and project manager for a school in Jersey City. Right. And I was twenty one years old. Yeah. You know, that's a lot. I looked like a, a baby at the time. Yeah. And I was running running foreman meetings. Right, for like all these union workers. Yeah, they were like in their forties and didn't really want to listen to me. So, right, you know, it kind of helped me like 
learn how to talk to people. Right. Um, and yeah, then I got into sales. So like, yeah, building consensus. And yeah, building but then training. I was like, you know, my passion was always fitness and right. training and working out, right, and right. fighting. Yeah, so, yeah, that's awesome. That's a, that's a that's a that's a hell of a start. <laughs> I think like when I first opened the gym, I made it a point to to like seek the best Muay Thai instructors, the best boxing instructors, the best boxers. Like, right. make sure they're all like professionals mm -hmm. in their field, so it gave us a lot of credibility. Right. And then I like learned from them, you know, learned right. from them, I, and I learned like on the fly. I was working with high level guys all the time, and then I just started fighting. Right. Promoters would come to the gym, hey, you have any fighters? I'm like, yeah, I'll fight. Yeah. And oh, so that's how you started. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So that's cool. And so did you, was the idea that you would have these instructors like that and you wanted to kind of appeal to everybody or did you, did you have ambitions of having like men and women that would come up as, as pros, like your pro program versus, you I know, think for everybody you know, else or? To make money, mm -hmm. you need to cater to everybody. Right, right. But you need to cater to the masses. Like right. the fighters are maybe one percent of the target, right? Like right. Your athletes, your high level athletes are probably right for you. Yeah. It's it's small. It's small, yeah. And you're not gonna make much money off them. It's more about your right. experience, it's about your passion. Correct. It's about helping people. Definitely. And then, you know, the other side is, you know, you're driving to the micro new end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean that was like more passion, that was more like, you know, money driven to like fuel the engine yeah definitely I mean that's a lot of like kind of where we're sitting right now like I, one thing I grew up loving was strength sports I love powerlifting I like weightlift Olympic style weightlifting even though I was never good at it and never really yeah. but I just admired it and always liked it but like growing up the only places you could go to powerlift were like I mean you probably could visualize it too it's like they're like dirty oh. gyms like rough, rough dudes gyms. yeah like not a place when you were like a kid like me who wanted to like walk in and be like and, and it's intimidating. It's like it's she says they're kind of looking at you like yeah. So it's like it's an ego check. Like everyone's trying to like yeah. Put you down. And I, when I was that young, I didn't have that type of like self reassurance like that. Like like now I love going to powerlifting gyms. Like yeah. I'll walk in and those guys can lift like four times of me. You know, at, 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 on the drop of a dime. I don't care, but I don't care. Exactly. Like, yourself. Exactly. Took your knowledge, you know. Right. Exactly. But like back then, I wasn't, and you know, I, but I loved powerlifting, and I loved, I love barbell sports, and I, and I, those environments were are kind of inherently still unapproachable for some people. So there's still a lot of people who are interested in lifting and who are interested in, in performing or working out that way. And one thing I wanted to give was like a legitimate environment. Like this was built in the image of a powerlifting gym, but it's approachable. It's like nobody in here is like you saw when you came in. No yeah. one in here is a dick. Like no one ever wants. Yeah, to. and I think it's the culture that you create. Mm -hmm. I think one thing about my gym, and, and you like you know ask anyone that, that goes there or works out there, you know, can attest that like you know we built the culture culture from day one of like there's no egos. Right. You know, and everyone's like family. Everyone's welcome. Right. And. The instructors like teaching there, so like, right. When you have that environment, yes, people like come in and they can be themselves and they can feel comfortable. Right. And like at the end of the day, if you know what you're doing, if you're a fighter, like mm -hmm. you're humble. Right. Exactly. It's the people exactly. that don't know what they're doing that think they're like macho and tough. And exactly. Like, and I still yeah. get kicked out of it because I never go to like fitness gyms, you know, like crunches mm -hmm. or yeah, no, right. or anything yeah, like the gyms. And when I do. Like everyone has their headsets on, they're like trying to impress. Yes, you exactly. Know, and you go to a gym like, even like Marcelo's, you go to a gym like that, like mm -hmm. high level, high level jujitsu athletes, and right. everyone's like super cool and friendly. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Because you know, they know they're badass. You know? Right, it's exactly. different. Right, yeah. they're, they're not trying to prove anything. No. Yeah, that, exactly. And that's honestly, at the end of the day, how most uh, like barbell gyms are, like those, those rough, scary places. Everyone there, it's the same thing, it's the same ethos. It's like, yeah. No one, like, they'll help you. If they see that you want to come and show up, like, they'll ask you to lift in their group. Like, they'll ask you to do, oh, that's cool. you know, it's like, that'll happen, you know? And, and there's a lot of great barbell gyms in the city now that have popped up over the years that just have some strong people and they're all cool people. Like, I, I know a lot of them. They're, it's, so it's this, it kind of has that jujitsu, like, MMA school ethos uh, in some ways. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, but you know, like, I, it was the same idea here. I kind of wanted to create sort of the same space that people who are maybe just uninitiated to it like could come and try it out and feel so, welcome. Yeah, and feel welcome and then still have people come in here who like you know, they can throw around a lot of weight and you know 
they are legit. I hope they do. Awesome. You know? so, yeah, cool. definitely. So, um, so let's go back to the fighting for a sec. So once you said the promoters, they came in and like they're looking for uh, like opponents for guys that they had on their cards, yeah. and then you were just. Like, I was training. Or... I was training with, you know, all my instructors at the time were fighters. Mm -hmm. So I was training them and training myself, and like we were kind of like right. just a crew of like working out together. Right. And um, you know, get good jujitsu guys at the gym at the time. We had this guy Jay Hayes, who was a brown, a brown belt, and he got his black belt, mm -hmm. and he was with JT Torres. So JT Torres was still like a brown belt. Right. Like when I opened the gym, he was coming in training. Oh wow. And working out, and I was doing privates with him. Like oh, that's awesome. On a regular, like when I started fighting. Yeah, yeah. So um, we always had like just high-level guys around who were training, and then, you know, when promoters would come by looking for fighters, we had the amateur guys. Right. And the amateur circuit's a little different. Like, you know, you prepare for these fights, and then people back out, like, left and right. Yeah, yeah. So I think my first, like, two or three mm -hmm. cards or fights that I was supposed to fight on fell through. Right, oh, wow. Yeah. And I remember I was going to one that I was supposed to fight on, and I was bringing this guy, Gil, who I was training with, to training, and... We, you know, he fought, I ended up not fighting. My guy didn't show up. And there was this kid, Mighty Mouse, on the, on the car. Mm -hmm. Sort of little black stocky kid. Yeah. And he knocked this guy out in like, I think the first round. Wow. And we get in the car, and, it, and my, my friend Gil was like a little ghetto. Mm -hmm. And his boy is like this Dominican dragon. So he's like, oh, you gotta see this kid, Mighty Mouse, he's nasty. I'm like, dude, I'll whoop that guy back. <laughs> he's like, no, you wouldn't. So he kind of bet me there. Right. So like, when I got back the next day, I reached out to the promoter and I said, when's that guy fighting? I want to fight him. Right. So then I, I ended up fighting him for my first like, amateur fight. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is a different Mighty Mouse than the yeah, Amateur Johnson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, That's what I figured. Yeah, yeah. That would be nice to have one. Yeah, I was going to say, that would be a cool amateur win. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, he ended up going on like afterwards and winning a bunch of pro fights. He was tough. Oh, that's awesome. But yeah, that was my first amateur fight. Wow. And how many did you, did you eventually have pro fights or how many fights did I you had? I had the amateur fight and then I had a bunch of amateur fights that fell through and then I was just like, I'm ready to fight pro. And I took a pro fight um, for the UCC, it was like a, it was like a local organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, This is all in Jersey? Because of Jersey, yeah, Canada, yeah, New York. Mark Kid was 1-0, and out, who got like a first round knockout in his wow. first fight. And then, yeah, I ended up knocking him out in the first round. So oh, nice. I wanted to continue going with it and uh, I tore my ACL. I got a herniated disc in my neck, and uh, it was just like a hard recovery. Right. And then by the time I was done, I was like so consumed with training clients. Right. And it was just like hard for me to like put that aside and put my energy into training. Yeah, yeah. Like training people all day like will zap your energy. Oh yeah. And totally. it's hard to do two a days or whatever. So I kind of put it on the back burner, and then I kind of like just drifted. Yeah, yeah. You know? And right. then I put more energy into like training people and training fighters. And, I mean, I still have a passion for it. I love MMA. I love yeah, too. yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. A lot of the, some of the people I've been lucky enough to interview and just cross paths with over the years who like had their own like impressive athletic resumes, but then went on to become really good coaches. They all say it's some version of the same thing that it's like it is really hard to be an athlete and coach at the same time. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like if you can, yeah, if you can pull it off, it's amazing. But like, it's it's just it, I I tend to agree. I think. Um, one guy that was on the podcast, he said that he always felt like you have to, to be a good athlete, you have to be a little selfish, and to be a good coach, you have to be a little selfless, yeah. because you're going to have to give up your time yeah. to, like, to, to be able yeah, to I mean, train. When those guys yeah, when you're, when you're training, like, it's not like you're training for a triathlon or you're training to go run. You're training to get into a cage and fight somebody. Yeah. So it consumes you. For sure. Yeah. Every day you're like, I need to do more than this person. So you're trying to do, you know, work out twice. Yeah. Day. you're trying to push it and then it's you know you need your rest and recovery for sure so yeah. if you're like dishing out your energy to clients it's 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 a hard balance right right so, definitely and that's yeah. why you see like a lot of fighters now like they they have to give up you know like their other job or whatever else they're doing and be like i'm gonna go all in on this right and just go for it yeah yeah or that's it you yeah know? definitely yeah it's 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 not something like it's funny because like to use the powerlifting analogy that might be the one sport where the coaches like for a while hang with the athletes because they all live together yeah but like every other sport you're like fighting for instance you're literally training to fight somebody else and like it's i think even the mental 
like relating to other people because as you know like when people get into jujitsu or, or or any combat sport that's like a lot of your social circle too so these are like the, this is like the feedback you're getting from other people yeah and so it's like can be hard to go into normal situations oh I yeah think, you know 100%. yeah so it, like it relate to normal things yeah, it, consumes, it consumes your life right? yeah that's so it's hard like. to like be a good personal trainer right or a good coach if mm -hmm. you're focusing on your improvement you know? right right Where on the other side like you said you have to be selfless yeah so if you're trying to like improve and help others mm -hmm. it's hard right it's hard. exactly no totally so i kind of like found the crossroads and you know at the end of the day like i feel like if your goal is not to be the best mm -hmm. especially in, in like a combat sport yeah you don't want to be the ufc champion or if you're jiu-jitsu and you don't want to be a world champ like your goal is not to be a world champ right like, why are you doing it yeah exactly. and like, i did that with wrestling in college like i wrestled in college and i went to college being i want to be a national champion mm -hmm. and as soon as my desire like partying and whatever else and like people weren't as motivated on the team and everyone was like what kind of party so i was like kind of lost the drive and as soon as my mind switched to be like i don't want to be the best of the best right like, why am i gonna right spend all my time killing myself yeah, doing two a days, you know, not enjoying my younger years or like partying and having fun. Right. So like, just be on the team. Yeah. And just have like a winning record or make conferences. Like. Right. I just didn't think it was. Yeah, yeah, you know. And I, and I, felt, yeah. I feel the same about, you know, like MMA. If you don't want to be the best, and you're not gonna put everything into it. Yeah. There's two MMA. You're killing again. yourself. Yeah. You're beating your body up. You yeah, know? yeah. There's too much on the line to. to and there's too to many be. people out there that are hungry. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's so hard to be like a stay at gym. Right. You have all these. As soon as you get comfortable, you have people that are sleeping at the gym, mm -hmm. waking up and just like. Right. Well, dreaming of it, like that's they're so hungry for it. Right. Exactly. They and want to take what you have, you know. Yeah, and I mean, this is something I I wanted to ask you about too. Like it would seem to me that like. But what my impression is always when you have somebody who rises in the ranks that was that young guy or girl that comes up becomes the champion and might have a very public blueprint now everyone saw that blueprint they can do the same thing now they're just gonna be on your shoulders and now like they're butting heads with you, you yeah know? i don't know if that's true or not but no i mean yeah. from what i've seen yeah i mean it's definitely tough to like you set a goal and then you achieve that goal it's hard now you have to set a new goal Right. right. So it's like when you're the top of the top, like what goal do you set? I'm right. gonna be the greatest ever. Right. So I wanna defend my title like fifteen times. Like it's gotta be hard for John Jones to wake up every day and be hungry. Yes. Right? Like, exactly. Like, everyone wants to fight him. Mm -hmm. Like he's been there so long. Right. That it's like, what drives him now? Right. You know, now he has three daughters, he wants to be a good father, like, right. he wants to give back to the community and he wants to be known as like the greatest right. mixed martial artist. But it's still like, how do you wake up and go five, right, five minute rounds with another guy who's so hungry, right. his whole life he just wants to be the champ, right? And he has the opportunity and he'll do whatever he can to like get there, right? Absolutely. And you're yeah. kind of just coasting, like, mm -hmm. you know, I wouldn't say coasting, but right, it's different, you know. Right. Well, you've kind of, from your perspective, because you've seen sort of all levels from and like amateur circuit in New Jersey now to the top, because like we were talking before, but your resume now includes cornering and having worked with Valentina. Yeah, and so yeah. that's so you so you've seen like both ends of the sandwich, like everything, yeah. you know. I mean, do you see? Um, do you, like she? How many defenses has she had? Like two or three? Or, two or three. Yeah, yeah. I think that was the third. Yeah. So, do, are do you hear discussions like that around her camp at all? Like, or do you I see mean, someone she's, like her? She's just, just still hungry. so hungry, right? Mm -hmm. And she loves being where she is. And I don't think she sees herself being anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So I think to take the title from someone like that, that's, she's still so hungry to prove, mm -hmm. you know, she's a martial artist, yeah. too, so, which is so cool. Like, she loves, like, continuing to learn, right. continuing to get better, continuing yeah. to win in different battles, you know, like, yeah, yeah. whether it's on the ground or it's head kicks or whatever. So I think she's just, like, she's envisioned it since she was younger, mm -hmm. and she's very, like, militant and discipline right that for someone like that with that personality it's, it's gonna be hard yeah it's gonna be hard. and that's why she's so dominant mm -hmm. you know right so right now in that weight class i just don't see anyone really 
giving her a run. Right, you know? right, definitely. And she might have to go back out and fight with me. Yeah, yeah, it's like, well, that would be, yeah, that's She's open to it. She wants to fight anyone. And like, she, I think she's fighting again in June, and that was like too far away for her. Like, she yeah. wanted to fight sooner. Right, right. So, I just saw they booked her, right? Against yeah, the, June, yeah. Yeah, Calderwood, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That'll, yeah. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where is that? It's in um, Australia. Wow. Okay. So that's kind of amazing. For you guys as coaches, is that like when you see, like, if a fight's in Australia, basically like a world away, like time zone wise, like yeah, like me when I'm thinking, I sometimes think sometimes these things fall on the strength coach of like, all right, how are you gonna adapt to being like 24 or 23 hours ahead or something, you yeah. know? Or well, yeah, I'm sure she'll go out like you know ten to two weeks earlier mm -hmm. and spend time and like get right into training. Right, you know, mm -hmm. and just like shake the body out, and then yeah, get her rest when she needs. So I mean, she's very focused. Right. The thing I noticed is like I was out there in Houston for ten days with her, and they don't waste energy on on like pointless conversation or stuff that doesn't matter to their goals. Like she's probably the most focused person I've ever seen. Yeah, that's um, interesting. Yeah, where yeah, I mean, she trains hard, and then she she's just like always so zoned in. Right, and. They're on, she's on such a good rhythm with her coach because mm -hmm. the same coach she's had since she was like five. Right. That she has such respect for him, mm -hmm. trust for him. Right. And I think that's important for any athlete, like to have a coach, a mentor, like in business or someone that you trust so much. Right. That you can, you know, that you've been with that knows you so well. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I think that's that's kind of a, especially in such a high stakes sport, that's probably even more valuable. Like I know, like even in, in this field, that's valuable. But like, shit, if you're getting like, <laughs> like kicks and punches thrown at your head, oh, yeah. and you know, and that's how you're making your living, and that could have lasting impacts either way. Like, I yeah, I mean, I, I think like you know? the one thing that's that you need to focus on the most as a as a high level athlete is your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think especially in combat sports, it's it's such a mental, yeah, such a mental game, mm -hmm. and. You know, if you can get out of your own head, you get the experience of competing a lot. You know, and you can just see like it's visual. They visualize that they're gonna win, right, over and over again. They visualize themselves in the cage or jujitsu guys like Gianni or these guys that the train and visualize themselves right. winning and competing, and they compete so much that it becomes second nature. Right. Yeah. Of course, the nerves come. Yeah. But I feel like if you don't have nerves, then you don't care. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. You're so passionate about it and you want to win so bad that the nerves are going to be there no matter what. Right. right. No matter, you know, anyone can say, oh, you know, like you fought so many times. Right. Like to, to Valentina. But, oh, and you're, you're supposed to dominate, but it's a fight. Anything can happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting that you say because I, I hear that from people who are around like very high level people at whatever it is they do. It, it usually comes down to the mind because. To be at the top ranks of MMA, we already know your physical preparation is probably like as good as it can be, yep. and you're starting to look for these like differentiators. Is it your mind? Is it you know? That's why I I mean I think recovery is tremendously important, but I think that's why you see like recovery probably being like probably approaching like a billion dollar business is because other people are trying to just one one up one another, you know, competitively. I guess you know. Yeah, yeah. I think as the sports grow, jujitsu. Mm -hmm. MMA, combat sports. Um, I mean, there's just more people getting involved in it. Yeah, and they're definitely. just putting more time into it. Yeah, so like you always feel like you want the edge, right? right. And that and that edge is going to give you the mental edge, right? And so if you're training harder or more often than anyone else, you're going to be confident, mm -hmm. right? So exactly. Then you're like, but then at the same token, you need rest and recovery. Exactly. You need your body, right? Right. So it's it's yeah. a tough balance, and I, I I guess everyone's body is different, right? So you would have to. It is, kind yeah. of play with stuff to see what works best for you. Right. But like before, you know, back in the day, like Marcelo didn't believe in strength training. He right. Just believed in. I remember. Yeah. And just jujitsu, like just train jujitsu. But even now, like he, he believes more in doing other stuff, some cross training. Like he does right. Pilates and he does some strength stuff. Yeah. And, and now you, you see more of the athletes today in jujitsu, like doing a lot of strength stuff. Like Gordon Ryan's huge. Right, and he's lifting almost every day. Exactly, yeah. yeah, exactly. When when I saw him and like his transformation, and then the subsequent dominance of the sport, I was like, you can't tell me now that strength doesn't matter. <laughs> like when you watch that, you know. So it's 
Yeah, and like you said, it's, it sets a tone for people being interested in it. Like, Jiu Jitsu to me was always interesting because when I started training, and like I was already doing this as a career when I had started training, Jiu Jitsu that is, and uh, the one thing I noticed is that any like principles of strength and conditioning or any modalities or whatever you want to call it, it was all like weird stuff people were into. It was never like, Usually when you go around sports that basically have money in them, so like football, yeah. basketball, baseball, like these sports, there's really good coaches and because there's a lot of money that was poured into the science and studying yeah. things and how it affects people, even Olympic sports. And uh, track and field, like Nike's probably responsible for more track and field studies than like anyone ever, because and for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, but anyway, like Jiu Jitsu, there, was, there wasn't really any money in it, so like it just wasn't very well studied. And I always was like, man, this this is like, I just liked it so much. I was like, this kind of deserves a little better. So I, yeah. that was where I was like, let's let's see what we can do. Like, let's, let me, like, I want to be able to, to help so these guys. So over like the last couple of years, you've been really studying yeah. kind of like the recovery and the strength process. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. that's cool, man. Yeah, definitely. That was like my thing. Once I, I was like, once I got my blue. So what if, if, if you don't mind me asking yeah, yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, go for it. What, yeah. is that, what does that look like? like Right. As far as like how often do you feel like a jiu-jitsu athlete mm -hmm. should strength train? Right. Um, like what the recovery looks like. There's like, like yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, there's basically two considerations I would say. One is is you have to be honest with yourself about what your level is, like in terms of if you want to be a competitor or if you want to be someone just recreational, because that sort of changes things a little bit. Yeah. Um, if you're gonna be a competitor, the reason the reason that's important is you're probably training a lot five days a week, like, so you don't, in reality, your strength and conditioning needs to manage that fatigue, so you can't train in here five, like, four, three, four days a week yeah. if you're training jujitsu that much. So really, your optimal amount is probably something like two days a week, so a lot of programs I write for guys who are, are at a high level, or, or even if they're not at a high level, but just compete often, is usually two days a week, like, while they're and getting ready. When you start them off, do you, do you start them off slower, like lighter weights, more movement, mm -hmm. like getting them accustomed to these new movements. Cause like the one thing I noticed like when I was fighting, mm -hmm. or even like when I was just recently training Jiu Jitsu and Khan before like I got my black belt, right. was I don't want to be sore for my next training session. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah. So like I didn't want to like do powerlifting because then I was like, man, I'm not gonna be able to walk and then yeah. I'm gonna train with these killers and yeah, like, my exactly. body's gonna be like, I'm gonna be like, Fall apart. Right, exactly. So, you know, they perform as well. You know? Yeah, definitely. No, that's a, that's a huge thing to to account for. The the thing that I usually, um, the thing that I'm usually doing is it's I'm looking at the individual. So, like, if this person is already strong, like I have different strength standards, like different things. You could just look at someone and just yeah. see like how they're moving around, how they're doing like weight the and markers. Yeah, they're both strong dudes. I don't need to sit there and like be like. Mm, you're not deadlifting 400 pounds, so like, you know, it's like, that, no, it doesn't matter. That's not a thing that matters. Um, what, you know, what you want to look at there is like the problems they're having, like if they're telling you this, I mean, I'm just kind of giving you hypothetical because not those people, but yeah. like, if someone's really strong, but maybe they feel like they're, they're they, they can't repeat consistent, like hard efforts, they'll say something like, oh, I go for a sweep, maybe a second, but I don't have the gas for a third if I miss, and I, like, it's there, but I can't do it. Like, that's like kind of a power energy systems problem. So you might want to work on the endurance a little bit, but you also might want to work at the other end of the spectrum with like more explosive exercise and endurance there. So, um, you know, and then there's some people, and then this is that other side of the coin that I was saying, like the recreational athlete, is that a lot of people that are attracted to jujitsu are usually into jujitsu because they don't like working out. And it's like a, it's it's it gives them like the physical satisfaction of working out it gives them the community they probably are in the martial arts or fighting even like yeah. on a recreational like they like to watch it but they don't like to work out like yeah. really so that becomes a problem because jujitsu it doesn't matter if you're doing it for fun you're still like like i still roll with mateus and he still can throw me around and like i'm still feeling the effects of it or you are or not you but like this hypothetical yeah. recreational person so you need to like prepare your body for that so um, a lot of those people usually lack mobility and strength. So like, you know, basic shoulder and hip mobility, they, a lot, a lot of times will complain about, you know, neck aches and things like that. Yeah. So 
I'm always working on basic strength exercises to make sure their posture is good. Um, po um, like posterior chain stuff is really big. So basically making sure the, the all the back muscles, glutes, hamstrings, calves are strong because you're going to be in deep knee flexion. You're going to be in like deep ankle flexion, hip flexion. Like you need to. I mean, jujitsu is like a series of flexing, extending oh, yeah. your hips. You know, so you need to have really healthy hips, really healthy glutes. And, and that's, that's, like, that's universal. Like, I've always had tight hips. Yeah, and yeah. like it hasn't helped with jujitsu. Like, right. Yeah. Just, I mean, it, it opens them up a little mm -hmm. bit more, but they're still like yeah. so wound tight. You know. Right. Mobility at any level is kind of a problem. A problem, I think. Like it's just help helping people understand where where they can move and can't move and then you know if and at that point you usually start to see where the individual like really doesn't move well because I've had some people whose hips are like super mobile like someone like Rayhan like he's he's like incredibly mobile. like mobile and flexible same with Munch like yeah, yeah exactly yeah I don't know <laughs> yeah I asked him that one time <laughs> <laughs> but but like Rayon, for instance, like he had told me, I like to ask questions. Like one thing I love doing when I'm around high level people is figuring out how many questions I can ask them without annoying them. Just cause I, I want to know like what. Yeah, but that's what makes you a great coach. Mm -hmm. So like in business too, like even, you know, I do real estate and in sales, I've been, been coached by some mm -hmm. of the best coaches in real estate in the last couple of years. And they always say selling isn't selling, it's mm -hmm. asking right. the right question. So when you find out, you know, like, so I love doing the same thing. Right. I love asking questions and seeing like how someone got somewhere, right. what they do, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's technique or yeah, yeah, what their motivation is or their story. You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's cool. You no, know, it is. Yeah. And that's how you learn and you grow. And to, yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. And like to that point, when you're around someone who's really good in business, sports, or otherwise, like they got there to that point because of something they were doing right. You know, they might have flaws. Everyone yeah. has flaws, as well, but. They, they did, the bulk of what they did was probably pretty decent, at least in that realm to get them there. So the way I always look at it is like, well, let me see what works for you. Cause that was one thing that Charles Poliquin taught me is that like everyone sort of has a different personality type that should affect their training. And I've heard people describe this on so many different levels. This was something Steve used to say a lot. It's just, everyone says it differently. Like he would say that like some people, cause he was training before, I think it was 2016 Olympics. Um, Helen Morales and um, Victoria Anthony, and they were training wrestlers, partners, right? wrestlers, yeah. yeah. And they were both trained, like they would come to his gym and train with them at the same time. And he said that both of them had such vastly different personalities, he had to like kind of structure their training different. And one of them was extremely competitive and was like, well, why is she doing like this? And I'm not, and he was like, that's cause it, I'm gonna botch it. But he's like, he's like, that's because she has the personality of a Hellcat and you have one of like a sleeping giant. Like it's or something like that. So you still like stroke their ego. Yeah. And like made her feel all right. Right. But yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what that's why I think like you know, great athletes don't always make the greater the best coach. That's very true. Right. Yeah. Because they might have their way of the way that they mm -hmm. learn, mm -hmm. and they might force that on people. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Whereas like you notice the the best coaches are open. They're always asking questions. They're always learning from other people. Right. And they learn how to adapt to each individual with their training. Right. Right. Because everyone exactly. learns differently. Exactly. So exactly. A hundred percent. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah no. Definitely. It's it's a hundred percent true. It's like I think when I, when I was coming up, I played hockey very like, competitively from the time I was like this tall until you know late teenage years. But I remember when the pack started to separate. Like I could see like okay, like I, I hit puberty before everybody else, so I could play with the bigger guys. And I could play for longer. Like it made up for the skill because I was physical enough to yeah. kind of keep playing. And as I got a little older, I was like, oh, wow, okay. So I can keep up with these guys, but I don't have the stick handling skills to like, to, to be able to, you know, be, be a first line center. Like I just, I need to bring that up. But like the rate at which I was bringing that up was so much slower than the way everyone else was coming up around me. And I, that was when I started thinking about coaching. And I started, and I would talk to the assistant coaches. I'd be like, like, have you ever thought about like X or Y or why does this work or why does this doesn't work? And that was when I, the bug started in my head. So I was like, I bet you I can do that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this because I like being around it and I love being, I, lo I love thinking about these problems, but I knew that I just, whatever it was, it was like, I, I could work on it I should, for sure, but my mind just worked differently. And I just, I, I, I remember, 
And I didn't start wrestling until my freshman year in high school. Mm -hmm. And I, I was a very competitive person. So, mm -hmm. you know, my first year, I was like wrestling varsity, I was probably like 500, mm -hmm. right? Like I probably was like 12 and 12. And then I was like, that's it. Like I hated losing. So I quit every other sport and just focused on just wrestling. Right. And <laughs> luckily I had like a great coach mm -hmm. who was like phenomenal. And my off season coach, and he would have me teach the kids class. Right. And he always said the best way to learn is to teach. And I'm happy that I learned that at a young age. Like yeah. I was like probably 15, mm -hmm. 16, because it's true. When you start teaching, you start realizing all the little details that were taught to you. Right, exactly. That you're not actually doing when you're competing right. or training. So like, I always made it, you know, a big effort to like teach more. Right, because right. it actually helped me grow. Right, and yeah. I still do it to this day with like with real estate or with my gym. Like, I always try to like you can't be. I always say you can't be uh, a tour guide of a place you've never been. Uh, so okay. like you have to be there. Mm -hmm. You have to have been in the trenches. Right, and have done it. Right, right. But then it's good to like it, it's good to to be in there with, doing it with them. Right, and right. Like teaching because then you learn. You're yeah, I'm learning as I'm doing this. Right, like, right. as I'm teaching them to make phone calls to real estate. Or like as I'm teaching at the gym, I'm like relearning like yeah. combinations and punches and yeah, you stuff get sharper. Yeah. Like, yeah, you get sharper. Yeah, definitely. I even noticed that too. Uh, we were talking before about RC, and he's been on the podcast. And like when he started teaching masters at Masters Guy, like it was like a year, not even a year ago. Like his game from then to now, it's just like it's like in insanely. Like it, I don't have the words to like yeah. just the, that that trajectory of how. Much I also feel like, like you look now. You're also a coach, right? So people look up to you. Yes. So now there's like an accountability level. Yeah. So now like you're learning outside of teaching, right? Like you want to be a good coach, right? And for those that want to be a good coach and they want to have an impact on people and they want to help, right? Right. From a from a natural place of helping, right? They're gonna spend the time on the outside, like learning new techniques, yeah. fine tuning stuff, trying to come up with systems. Mm -hmm. Right, it's different just to like show move and then, and like next week, oh, I'm gonna show this, and then next week, oh, I'm gonna show that. Yeah, but like if you want to actually care about your students or care about the people that you're trying to help, like you try to come up with like a system that will work. Yeah, you know? definitely, of course. Yeah, I, when I was just in um, in Houston, um, and Valentina obviously had her fight coming up, so we weren't doing a lot of technique, right? There's just a lot of training and a lot of situational stuff, and I was putting her in different positions to just give her a look to make sure she's comfortable in it. Yeah. And then she would go off and train with her coach like hit pads at the end of the session and I would work with her sister and Nina. Mm -hmm. And then each day like I would just add on right. a little bit more, a little bit more. And the other guys who were training with us, you know, were like fluent purple belts in jiu-jitsu and they wanted to learn some of the technique. Mm -hmm. So I think like the second day a guy came up and said, Hey um can you teach me that? I'm like sure. Like get in my back. And I said, Anthony, and I need to teach it. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And it was fresh. I'm like, I taught her for two days the same technique. Right, right. So now she was like, wait, I don't know. I, I can't, like, yeah, she had yeah. to think about it. And I'm like, all right, think about it. Right. Think about the details that I, and so I made her go through it and teach it. So I had her doing that almost every day afterwards. Right. Like she, I would teach her, we would drill it, we'd do situational training, and then I would make her teach it to one of the guys. Uh, them come over, right? And it wasn't even necessarily for those people, right? It was for her. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then she cool. like stuck with her, and now, yeah, and she feels more comfortable with it. And right. then like, I noticed when she's training live, she's getting to the position, she's able to react. She was like, because a lot of the time it's just small little details that they're missing. Right. Yeah. Definitely. So, definitely. Yeah. That's oh, that's really cool. I think too that you probably would see some level of that if you go into a lot of high level camps. I'm sure there's that that like fertile ground for learning. Like, I think I think when people are really comfortable with their coaches, they can tell there's dialogue. Mm, yeah. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Like exactly. You were saying that, you know, you started training Rayhan, right? Like, right. Like a long time ago and, and he's a doctor. He's a smart guy. So yeah. I'm sure he challenged you and asked you questions about different stuff. Right. And there's dialogue there. Yeah. So definitely. you can ask him like, hey, does this work or would that work or how do you feel after this? Mm -hmm. And there, and with that dialogue comes growth, right? right. Like communication. So right. I think that's key, like for any athlete, you know. Right. Definitely. Oh, absolutely. I think you know the funny, the funny thing like that I was reminded of when you were saying that is that when he, the one instance I can think of where he thought something I gave him didn't work it was weird because like this is where sports get really weird is that um, 
I gave him this, this gas tank, I call it a gas tank program. It was basically an endurance program because he was like, you know, I feel like I'm getting beat to the punch a little bit. Like I'm just like getting a little more winded than I should like in rounds, especially in these situations. And so I gave him this like cardio program that I came up with that I had been testing on myself. I was like, I kind of like it. It seems to work for me. Let's see if it works for you. We'll just make some modifications like that yeah. makes it more specific. He did it for about five weeks. He's like, and I was like, so do you think it's, do you think it's helping? And he's like, I, he's like, I don't know, honestly, like it's, it's okay. It's like, he goes, I, I don't feel, he's like, I don't feel as winded, but it's not as usually like acute as I usually feel changes when we like make a change. And then six weeks later, you ask me that question. Yeah. And I was like, all right, cool. And then he had just gotten his black belt and then he entered as many tournaments as he could because he wanted to qualify for worlds like earlier than everyone. And so, but he won gold three of the first four tournaments. And I was like, I was thinking to myself, I was like, I said, did you feel good cardio wise? He's like, I felt great. And I was like, well, do you think the program was still bad? And I was like, I'm not offended. It's fine either way. But I was like, this is the interesting thing. Was, for it, exactly. Yeah. It's like it, it, in powerlifting, it's like you lifted the weight or you didn't. But yeah. like, and you could hit that in training, you have to feel hit it again on the platform. Yeah. But like in, in jujitsu and these other sports, it's like, yeah, okay, you have great splits on like the aerodyne or something else, but it's like, you have to go win. Yeah, yeah, you have to win, exactly. Yeah. So we had this funny thing where it was like, it, it wasn't even like I was right, you were wrong or whatever. It was just kind of like, huh, I guess it kind of worked or I guess things are okay. Like we, yeah. we did it right, you know, that kind of thing. And you know, most, you know, I. I tell that story to tell the bigger point of like the trust that like nobody was trying to like outposture one another there. No, they were just like, yeah. oh, like yeah, that works. It's a team, yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's team a team. Thing, exactly. Right? Yeah. So I think I think that's like in, in anything, you know. Right. Exactly. Like if you have a team atmosphere, and you trust your coach and there's dialogue, and yeah, I mean, definitely, yeah. Have you been in, in flipping gears a little bit, still on that topic? Have you been around athletes that like? maybe were sort of journeymen and like kind of on their way out or were sort of like, um, or like how the mentality changes over the arc of a career, I guess is the bigger, broader question. Or have you been more around like starts, middles, ends? Or? No, I, I've, had, I've had both. Mm -hmm. um, I've had people that are still in the game, still mm -hmm. taking fights that probably shouldn't be. Right, yeah. Um, whether it's for paychecks or whatever, but mm -hmm. different reasons. Right. And, uh, or just the love to still compete right because I feel like when you compete so much mm -hmm. and especially in fighting there's I mean even jujitsu there's like a dopamine level yeah and like an adrenaline right and like it's hard to translate that or, or get that any anywhere else right so I think like people just are drawn to go back to it no matter how many times they're like, oh, I'm retired, I'm done. Yeah. Like, like, oh, I'm gonna go back and do it. Like Conor McGregor. Yeah, exactly. Like, he's yeah. retired. He made so much money, and yet he still wants to be right in the, spot, in the spotlight. He still wants that adrenaline because like, there's nothing else like it. Right. I mean, yeah. And and I've been around like some good fighters that won, you know, in front of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And then like last week, you know, two weeks ago, I was in Houston. Right. At the Toyota yeah. Center that was sold out. And I don't know how many that fits. Fifty. Yeah, probably I mean, more. <laughs> the place was like yeah. packed and like walking out with Valentino, just like the adrenaline and like everything. I'm like, damn man, I want to fight. Again. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, I'm 40 years old, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. And uh, you could just tell, like, even after, you know, she's so militant before, and then it was just like a weight off her. And like, you know, that feeling of winning, yeah. whether it's a jiu jitsu match or a wrestling match, when it's a one on one sport, mm -hmm. it's, it's different. Right. And it's like MMA, like, you get your hand raised. Right, it's it's a different feeling, and I feel like people are like addicted to that. Yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, yeah. I the reason I ask is because uh, a, fr a friend of mine who was also on the podcast, uh, going back a few episodes, he works mostly with NFL players, and the gym that he works at in Scottsdale, Arizona, like that's almost who they cater to exclusively. And he was talking about how like when there's guys there and. It's a little different, obviously, with the pay structure of the NFL versus the UFC. Yeah. But the moment he hears guys say, like, you know, like, this is my ninth year, whatever, like, I'm kind of feeling whatever, he's always like, if you want out, be out, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, just get out. Like, this is not the sport to, to fuck around with longer than yeah. you have to. Especially like, with, like, the head trauma, you're starting to... Exactly. 
yeah. you see, like no. Hernandez, like all these guys, like you know, yeah, exactly. You don't see it right away, but you see it down the road, right? And I find that with like with MMA too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I used to work. I cornered Jamie Varner from the WC and UFC right, 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 right. a while yeah. back, and mm-hmm. and he actually wrote like a really good article like a few years back about hard sparring. Right. And he's a competitor, yeah, so he sparred yeah. like he can spar really hard. Mm-hmm. And I think if you're sparring often and hard, the longevity for you is like is going to be a lot shorter. Right. So I, I think it's like if you go to Thailand, right. what I've seen is like they do the majority of their fights when they're kids. Right. Because kids don't hit as hard. Right. That's you're not taking yeah. as much trauma. Right. But yet you're getting all this experience. Right. And then when they spar, they don't spar like super hard. Right. They like, it's almost like these drills. It's like playful. Yeah, it's yeah. like playful. They're not taking a lot of head damage. Right. And then they go they go fight and they do their thing. But right. you notice that they don't get as much head trauma as guys that are like, like boxers. Right. Exactly. Right. They have these bigger gloves and they have headgear. Yeah. So they think they're okay and they can take these punches and they spar so often. But you're getting your brain moving around so much more. Exactly. Yeah. For sure. For sure. So I think yeah. boxing. There's more head trauma than any other sport, and then football too, because you yeah. have these helmets on. You don't realize the impact that has yeah. every time you hit somebody. And you're just like when you're in those pads, and even hockey too, like you feel kind of invincible. Like you'll launch yourself. Like and the adrenaline's pumping yeah. so much, so you don't feel it. Yeah, in a exactly. fight when you get hit, mm-hmm. like, you don't feel it. Right. Let's yeah. go. Like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And you it's know, like laughter. You're like, Oof. yeah. No, exactly. That's yeah. I mean, that's that's even like on a lower level. Why going back to what we were saying about jujitsu strength and conditioning. Why people will feel so good in the moment, like when their when their bodies are like real heated up, they're sweating, they can stretch, they can get in these angles. Like I feel great, and then an hour later they feel terrible, and it's because like they're putting their body through the ringer when they're when they kind of have that dopamine adrenaline. Yeah. Um, you feel like you're stretcher than you really are, and just the strength isn't there. Like, yeah. You just don't have the ability to do that. You need to. It needs to. You need to bulletproof yourself a little more, and like flipping. Entirely too. The other thing about the head trauma is, like, it's not even always direct. Like, I know, like, getting checked in hockey, it's like your body goes one way, your head goes the other. Like, that's the brain yeah. rattling too. I mean, I had concussions in hockey that, like, I remember at the time, like, no one would have thought was a concussion, but now I think back to it, and I'm like, oh god, that was. I had fractured skulls. I yeah. had like, four concussions. Oh like, god. And you don't realize it. And like, you know, they said when I was in high school, like, they didn't want me to play football. Right. Because of the head trauma I had as, as a kid. Oh wow! Just because I was wild, like you know, I was yeah. always trying to do like flips on my skis and oh geez, yeah, and I had, like two concussions skiing. Mm-hmm. Just like yeah, know, a wild kid, you know. But right. You don't realize how much it affects you down the road. You right. Know? Yeah. Definitely. So I feel like if you're an athlete and you're like, hey, it's time to hang them up, then I think you go to shuttle and yeah, do it. You know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, and one of the reasons I wanted to have you on too is because. You, you know, you were in it, you're coaching in it, you still are, you, you like have this intense interest in fitness and coaching and everything we were talking about. Yeah. But then also you have a really great real estate career too, like a yeah. whole other lane, like another lane you can take it. And like, because I don't wanna, and this is something that like, I've talked about with other friends who are involved in other sports with the, the guys you're getting out. It doesn't mean you always have to like be around the sport. You can like take that and invest in something entirely different. And that was why I thought you were an awesome example. So I know that that's that's something that people have talked to me about. So I wanted to show somebody like, oh, there's this guy Rich. He's got a great real estate business. Yes, he's still in this other stuff. But you don't have to do anything to do with your sport anymore. If you don't I want think to. everything's like you know a balance. Mm-hmm. Like as you get as you get older mm-hmm. and as you step back, like you know, I'm 39 years old, but I mean, mm-hmm. I'm still. I just got back from training myself, doing two rounds with Gianni and like right. rounds with all these high level guys. Mm-hmm. So I still like being in the fire and push. Right. My body obviously doesn't recover as fast and yeah. at least I'm a little more tired afterwards. But um, that being said, like, wait, what was the question? I'm sorry. No, I was just, it was, I was gonna ask you about how you got into real estate or like oh, what so gives you your fire there so I think else. I think I just, with the entrepreneurial mindset, like, mm-hmm. I always wanted to have my own gym, my own right. business, and I always wanted to have like revenue coming in. So if like I didn't want to have to work and I could take off a Friday and go train all day, right. I could do it. Right. So the money would be coming in. Right. So I found that I could do that with real estate too. Right. Like so, I instead of just jumping in and working for a company, I was like, 
Right. I don't do well with that, so let's, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. just do my own. I never did either. <laughs> yeah. So I started my own, and you know, you just have to trust the process, and a lot of time I just learned as I went, but mm -hmm. I feel like for athletes, they, they need to like think of their next form of right. income. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, they're, everyone's competitive. Right. Right? Everyone's, you know, in that level of like jujitsu, like especially around like Marcel and those high level black belts, they have ways to like, you know, you can open up your own school. Right. You can do kind of like what Marcel did. There's so right. much stuff online now. Right. That people want to learn from yeah. people that are the best at what they did. And yeah. Just, you know, you can do podcasts or you can do Yeah, exactly. You know, like yeah. online online Bernardo training. Did, yeah. yeah. Online training. Yeah. I mean Bernardo's a great example. Marcel yeah. is a great example. Exactly. And Gene Action, I think that was like one of the first ones exactly, like, yeah. People started subscribing to and now it's like it's blown up. Right, yeah, exactly. He was like ahead of the time in a lot of ways. That wasn't really like a common thing back then yeah. to have those subscription services. So I just think there's a niche and there's a way to try to mm -hmm. find Definitely. There's there's always a need, right? There's jiu jitsu is the cool thing about jiu jitsu yeah. is it's the adult martial art. Right? Yeah. As a kid, we grew up, there was like karate, taekwondo, all that stuff. And you did it as a kid and then it faded out. Right. Now, like, you see jiu jitsu, like, it's everyday people coming yeah, in exactly. and work and relieving their stress. Right. And then it's problem solving and they want to get better at it because they don't like getting beat and then they're yeah. hooked on it. And then it becomes like a lifestyle for them. Right. Exactly. So, like, yeah. There's such a big market for it where I think everyone can win. I do too, yeah. So absolutely. I feel like, you know, jiu jitsu athletes, for example, can, you know, can make money. They can practice, they can make money doing seminars, they can yeah. make money doing online stuff, they can make money doing the school. Right. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, and they're also, there's those same qualities too of like that you're interested in something else. Like, I remember uh, one of my clients was always telling me that he would go over to one of these, uh, like, hotel lot it was like ace hotel where they have like the stump town and they have like, yeah. like it's like a nice place to sit and hang out he said yeah, i'd go over there and walk past it every almost every day after training and bernardo would be there like on his computer and he'd be like and this was like before bjj fanatics was a thing but like he was building up his own personal blog like recording stuff like figuring out you know yeah, this time and yeah and, and like he just went up to him and was like he's like he asked bernardo what he was doing and he told them and they turned out they had like a common interest there and like but yeah, it's like, the, I I got a lot of being in that environment once I heard that story about Bernardo. And I always, him and I always had a good relationship. So like, I loved, especially when he was at like his world title run, I just loved seeing what he was doing every day. Like, I just like going into the gym and seeing like the habits of a winner. Like the, the habits best part of about Bernardo is you look at his mouth. Exactly, yeah. You know, yeah. And that's contagious. Yeah, exactly, right. yeah. So I feel like if you're a good person and you always want the best for people, happy like mm -hmm. people like to be around that exactly you know? so i mean yeah no matter what field you're in mm -hmm. you'll succeed right exactly you know? it costs nothing to be nice that's what, <laughs> that's that's what, what it does I, mean, I, mean, I, I feel like there's it i always say like or this thought just came to my mind the other day like are you doing things to impress or are you doing things to impact right and mm -hmm. like and i think it's a question that i ask myself before i do stuff Right. Am I doing it to make an impact on someone's life and help them? Right. Or am I doing it to try to like impress? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So um, I think if you come from a place of like good intentions, right, it's gonna get you far. Yes. Because people see that. Exactly, yeah. No. You end up in places that you sometimes feel like, whoa, how'd I get here? You know, right. Like for example, like training with Valentina and being in her corner and yeah. working with her. It was like, oh, like yeah. it just happened because she came to the gym and I wanted to help her and I just Right. I didn't have any intentions around it. Like I wasn't like, hey, let me take pictures and say I'm training with her and like yeah. and all that type of stuff. Like it just happened organically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like if you if you put in the hard work, no matter what it is, and you have good intentions, like eventually God will reward that. Right. Exactly. I always believe that there's more good in the world than there is evil in that oh, sense. Right. Like I've always believed that I'm, I'm an optimist like that. that and it's perspective. It's, yeah, know, exactly. If you have that perspective, yeah. You're gonna go around being a lot happier. Right, you gotta live. You know, each day you're gonna be like, oh man, like yeah, exactly. And then life is really good day. Yeah, exactly. I can't wait to help somebody. Right. Like yeah. instead of being like, oh man, I have to go to work. Like no, I yeah. get to go to work today. Exactly. I get to help people. Exactly. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's contagious. More people want to train with you. More people want to be around you. Like, Hundred percent. You create a culture of like, right, just improving the people around you, and I think that helps. Yeah. Hundred percent. I think that uh, one of the big lessons there too is like like attracts like. Like you were saying too, like you're like I get to do this. Like 
Like if you want to impact somebody, you're gonna go find people who want to be impacted or people who want to like actually, they're looking for the same thing you are. Whereas if, if it's like, you're just in this drudge, you're just like, you're gonna find other people. Misery loves company. Uh, but so does positivity, honestly. Yeah, exactly. That's how I look at it, yeah. Because a lot of personal trainers I would talk to, they would always complain about clients or this or that. And I'm like, I, I never could relate to a lot of that stuff. Because I was like, uh, people get mad when someone cancels. I'm like, whatever, I got an hour now. You know, I think it was a struggle that I've, I've had in the past. Yeah. And, I, and it, it's helped me where I used to, you know, compare myself. Yeah. I used to be like, this guy's doing good. I should be doing better. And, and I don't think I really started to succeed. And maybe it's not succeeding in like a financial level, right? Like where, you know, the money comes. But I think it was more of like a mental success, right? Where I was yeah. like, in clarity, where I was like, you know what? Like, I want to elevate these people. Right. And instead of talking bad or wishing bad on them, right. I wish success on them. Yes. Because like, I feel like you won't have success until you're in that position yeah. of wanting others to succeed. Right, right. And once you're there, it's just a good state of mind. It is, yeah. And especially in the fitness industry. Like, the people that are good trainers mm -hmm. and that have a passion for fitness and helping people, they want to see, see other people in the industry succeed. Oh, for sure. You know? Yeah, like, definitely. They don't want to see, like, there's enough to go around. Yeah, it's definitely. one of the biggest industries in the world. Yeah, for sure. Everybody wants wrong. to help their, you know, their health, their right. fitness, and getting better shape. Right. And it's continuing to grow. So, I, you know, I feel like that's pretty cool. You know, you see people that, right. you know, are in the same industry, but they still want other people to succeed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I don't think I could have said it any better. <laughs> no, definitely. So, what's uh, what's next for you? What do you feel like is the like big project? The reason I ask is because a lot of cool stuff has happened. I mean, you got your black belt in the past year. Yeah. That right. And then you, we were just talking before with the real estate, you're opening another office and expanding. You just had a, this really great cornering gig. And, and yeah, uh, and you got the gym. Yeah, I went out to LA. I, I was able to train with a pretty cool celebrity out there. Oh, that's cool. And uh, he's going to four, so maybe, you know, we'll see with that. But I just feel like, I just want to leave the door open for opportunity. You know, and I feel like if I'm just doing my best at what I can do, right. opportunities will come. Right. And if I'm chasing money, it's yeah. not, you're not gonna be successful. Right. You yeah. know, I, I think um, money will come. Yeah. And I think if there's something that you're passionate about and you can put your heart into it and you actually want to help and impact people, right. money's gonna come. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think you know, you know, I'm blessed and I think there's been some cool opportunities and I always try to surround myself with people that are positive and that are, you know, top of their field and you know, right. it can have some influence on me. The one thing, um, you know, having my own business, my gym, having, you know, two real estate offices mm -hmm. and being consumed with that, having a lot of employees, I always kind of felt like I was just always leaving, pouring mm -hmm. out. Right. And I felt like it was hard to like get poured into. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I have a real estate coach and I, and I talk to him like once a week for 30 minutes, right. but it's quick. Yeah, yeah. Right. So. The one thing I've been seeking like this season of my life is right, there's seasons. It's a good way to put it. And yeah. in this season of my life I feel like I'm really trying to seek um, more leaders in different avenues, different areas, like people who've been married for twenty years and have a successful marriage, like trying to seek advice from, from yeah. them around my marriage. Mm -hmm. Um business guys that are like been in business for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um trying to seek advice from them spiritual. You know, like pastors, like I want to right. ask them for information, like on whether this is right or I should be doing this. And, right. and I feel like this season of my life, I'm trying to get more people in, in my life that I can look to as leaders and look to as, for like advice. Right. And I think as, as combat athletes, as strength coaches and personal trainers, we pour so much into people yeah. that it's hard sometimes to just feel like we're drained. Right, right. And I feel like sometimes we need to look to like other people, mentors. Right. Um, kind of like more into us. Yeah, definitely. I was gonna ask you, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because that was something I would've even asked you personally, like how you go about that. Like how did you come to that realization for you? Because it sounds like for you it's, it's mentors, it's finding people who you can talk to and, and help kind of give yeah, back. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, or, you know, I've lived, you know, I've had the gym for over 12 years. I was young when I opened it. Right. It's on the waterfront in Hoboken. I, I think the first like, Eight years I was living in Hoboken. I was young. I was partying. I was right. fighting. I was teaching classes. 
was having fun. And then as I got older, you know, your ego kind of goes away. Right. You kind of like open up to more want to help people, make an impact on people. Right. And like, you know, become more spiritual. And, you know, so I started going to the great church and you start like learning stuff, you know, right. and, like that helps you and, and you know, your interest yeah. 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 That's so, cool. Yeah. You know, I, I have like a connect group with like a bunch of athletes, mm-hmm. jiu jitsu guys, and then, you know, Paulo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was coming to meet oh, cool. some guys community. And then like lunch comes. Right. Um, Phil, like a bunch of my fighters. Right. And uh, the, the church I go to is Hillsong mm-hmm. in New York City. And we do it at the church office like once a month. Oh, cool. And it's just, it's just cool to see like guys in this industry. That yeah. Are, like, personal trainers or macho or MMA fighters or yeah, jiu jitsu yeah. guys. And everything's like in. Right. Be vulnerable. Yeah. Have, like, their issues. Because like, right. You never, you, you don't see that with guys. You see it with women, right? They call right. their their girls and they're like, oh, this is happening. And yeah. as a guy, you keep everything in. Right. You think it's very healthy, like, and you, you realize that as you get older, so like, open up more. Yeah. About your struggles. Right. Open up, you know, and vulnerability, I think, is like, is like, uh, it's huge for building relationships. 100%. Like, yeah. It's hard to like, yeah. get to know somebody truly mm-hmm. if you're not vulnerable first. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, you need to have that. It's it's part of being honest. Cause, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, because it's not really honest if there's not. It doesn't. Not that everything has to be bad. It's just you know, not everything has the positive spin all the time. Yeah, you know, like you said. Yeah, being and, real. What's that? Being real. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's no. That's awesome. That's really cool to hear. That's. I, I think that we live in a good age for that. Like people starting to understand um, whether it's. Whatever label you want to put on it, mental health, whatever it is, like how important that is to just being and existing, you know. And um, that's that's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. What was was there a moment where you felt like, or is there was there ever something that was most because you're doing a lot, like was the most burnout worthy, like that? In other words, I'm trying to think of the best way to ask this question because I know for me, like I'm getting to a point too where I was like. Wow, I'm doing a lot. Like from the time I wake up till the time I go to sleep, and like still not everything is ever done. You know, yeah, like, yeah. that that I think gets. I think the one thing that I've realized is, you know, I have like massive ADD. Mm-hmm. I've always had yeah. right? and uh, I think with I can get so distracted. Yeah, right. Especially like I can go to the gym to do a small task. Like, hey, I need to like help hang a bag up, or I need to make sure like this is done, or. You know, go over my cash flow or go over my goals with my right general manager. The next thing you know, I'm there for three hours, like BSing with instructors, and I didn't get anything done. Right, right. right? And exactly. I can't do that right. with my time because I have goals I have with real estate, I have goals I have for the gym, mm-hmm. and I have a marriage. So I want to right, exactly. have a, you know, I want to thrive with my relationships. So the one thing that um, I always try to do is, and that's time block. You know, mm-hmm. I like, I have my planner, and it's like, Every morning, eight to eleven, I'm at my real estate office, right. and I'm doing like phone calls and prospecting and feeding my funnel. And and when I'm doing that, I'm not thinking about the gym. I'm right. not thinking about training. Mm-hmm. I'm not checking emails. Like right. everything That's down, right. and I'm focused on that. And so then you know then from eleven to to like one or two, like I try to train. Whether it's go to Marcelo, whether it's training with me at the gym, whether it's like now that you know I'm, I'm getting older, I'm trying to recover more, like. I love doing yoga. Right. I like doing movement stuff. I like doing Pilates. Right. I like doing CrossFit. Like I like doing kettlebell stuff. Right. 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 So it's yeah. like I'm trying to. Yeah. Every yeah. Sunday I write out my schedule for the week. Oh, that's cool. And yeah. if it's not on my schedule, it doesn't exist. Right. So I write it down. I have to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And I obviously like you visualize, right? Like mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever read the book Miracle Morning. No, I don't think so. No. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, if I, like, anyone that's listening to this, I don't know. Whoever you want, um, I don't know. I was Google, yeah, Miracle yeah, Morning. Yeah, it's Miracle Morning that talks yeah. about like um, all successful people have a routine in the morning mm-hmm. and do it before everyone else does. Yeah. So wake up at 5 a.m., write down your affirmations. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm thankful for this. You know, I'm thankful I have this. Um, I am a great personal trainer. I am a great strength coach. Right. You know, like, whatever it is, and you feed it to yourself. Then you visualize mm-hmm. like your goals. Yeah. You yeah. write them down. And then you you know you meditate or you exercise. Right. And then you go on. So mm-hmm. it's cool. I think it's I forget like all the keys, but it's like scribing, journaling, right. affirmations, visualize, 
like all this stuff before the morning starts. Right. And it sets your routine. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I mean, I don't know for you, but for me, like a lot of times, one of the first things I do is check my phone. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right? And it's like. Yeah, I know. I made actually an agreement with myself a few years ago that the first thirty minutes, it's like it's loose. It's like twenty to thirty minutes. That I wake up. You don't go anywhere near the phone. Yeah. I just wake up and I go sit on the sofa, walk around, make coffee. But like, okay. you know, yeah. When it's nice, I live in the backyard now. Like, like when it's nice, I go outside in the backyard. Yeah. And yeah, just just do that. And My wife and I have an agreement, like. Um, that we don't bring our phones into bed. Yeah, we do that. So like, I plug my phone in downstairs, mm -hmm. and like I'll go up, and then like no phones after like nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. So I'm not touching my phone. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, that was something that like we were talking a little bit about Steve. That like at the beginning, like he, Steve Maxwell was like my first real mentor in like all of this, and he was really big on daily rituals. I actually think that like you know that might have been something he got most famous for was how people were just so fascinated with like his, his morning and nighttime rituals because he, he him and Joe Rogan were have been good friends for a long time and like he was like one of the first fitness people Joe had on his podcast going way back. Yeah, and, yeah and, and Steve like shared these rituals and people were like, what? And I remember his email just like blowing up like people saying like, like wait, how do you do this? I'll do that. And he would make videos on it and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so he kind of like instilled that in me in like a non- not not even a too rigid way. He would just say, "Hey, like this is how, this like this is just something you need to do. It just brings more mindfulness to what you do, so you're not so consumed by everything all the time." And you know, he had all kinds of stuff, and so I started doing his like exactly. And then over to, over time, I just kind of deviated, and kind of kept what I uh, what like what worked for me, and then added other things. And, I I think and, and not to make yeah, yeah. but I think the biggest thing is consistency. Yeah, definitely, like, definitely, like. As you can see with with star athletes, right? Mm -hmm. They consistently do the same thing every day. Right. And I think like, you know, when I went to Marcellus years ago, I think it was like six years ago, um, I started doing privates with Gianni Grippa. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we became drill partners. I was drilling with him five days a week. And I mean, you can't be more disciplined than that guy. Yeah. No, right. I mean you. like he's just so consistent. Right. With his his daily routine and so plugged in and yeah, and I think it's like, you know, it's good to be around him. You know, you pick up some yeah. of those habits. Mm -hmm. I mean, definitely. Yeah, so I, I think, and I think with real estate, like with owning your business, like if you want to dial up and scale up, right? Like you need to consistently go there. Nothing healthy is going to just go up like this, right? right? Exactly, because yeah. then it's going to fall just as hard. Exactly. So if you yeah. like gradually just put in a little bit every day, yeah, and that mindset one percent better, one percent better. Yeah, and you, and you just like constantly feed into it. That's like yeah. Down to happen. So that's why, like, if I have it on my schedule and I consistently do it, yeah, I know I'm gonna get better. Right, yeah. right. No, definitely. And then also on the flip side of that too, the way I I think about things the same way, it's also nothing will surprise you too much if something goes wrong. Because like, if you have that crazy growth, the harder they come, the harder they fall. So it's like you know, if you have those hiccups, they don't they don't cause like catastrophic failure you know it's it's like oh we have we have something we got to deal with here yeah it might be taking a step back but you're very familiar with the process it doesn't shock you it doesn't i look at it like this too on a spiritual level like god won't put something on your plate mm -hmm. until you're ready to handle it right he's yeah. not gonna keep, like i mean this is a weird analogy but like take it for what it is yeah you know, you're not gonna win the lottery or get all this money Right. You don't know how to handle the money you have now. Yes. Right. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. finances, like tithing or putting money into savings. If you're like blowing your money, right, you're not gonna all of a sudden like become a millionaire. Right. Like you know how to need to know how to like handle your money. Right. The same area, like mm -hmm. yeah, on training, right? Yeah. Like you go through the process of training athletes, right? Right. For maybe low to little cost. Right. As what you would do for. But you're building up your resume. You're right. learning how this works, and you're kind of like in the trenches, growing, building your resume. Right. And then all of a sudden, you're at this point of just consistently getting better, right. learning, learning, learning. And then all of a sudden, you're like, "Whoa, I'm training this high-level person. Oh, whoa, I have a larger gym than yeah. I first started with. Like, this is your second location. Right. Yeah. And like, dream to have something larger. Right. Right. Exactly. It's like, yeah. It doesn't happen overnight. Like, Definitely you need not. to be in the trenches. You need to grow. Right. You need to. Right. Exactly. You know, like. Every 
every when you talk to anyone that's very very successful mm -hmm. their journey didn't happen like this no definitely not it was like yeah 100 percent, yeah and then they found themselves there and they're not surprised right exactly they've been like visualizing that planning that working mm -hmm. towards that for so long right 100 you know? yeah and i think it's yeah like my, my dad always would say like act like you've been there before and yeah. that's like a version of that like if you score a goal in hockey like don't don't act crazy like just you know, whatever, like, don't fist bump people and go to the bench, you yeah. know what I mean? Or go for the face off. And it's the same thing, it's like, you know, when you, it's it's like the analogy you gave, but it's like, you, you don't, you're not gonna get the money if you don't have to handle it, you know, yeah. or win the lottery. It's the same thing, it's like, you have to, you have to be there, and learn how to be there, and then it all kind of builds. And then you're not surprised when you're there. Exactly, right, exactly. exactly. You can so, sit next to celebrities, or you can sit next to mm -hmm. high level athlete, you can be right. working with them, and you're like, yeah, I'm not surprised. I've been doing this for long enough. Right. And I, I'm comfortable in my ability. Right. And, exactly. And yeah. my knowledge that right. I deserve to be here. Yeah. And, you know, exactly. And, yeah. and the opportunities will come and Absolutely. maybe they won't. But yeah, yeah. exactly. If you continue to keep doing what you're doing, I think opportunities will always come. Oh, definitely. One thing it's I a matter of like capitalizing and being in the right place at the right time, but I mean, yeah, but you kind of make your luck in that respect. I it's like, yeah, I always believe that. But you, if you're doing, and being in the trenches, the one lesson I've learned too is enjoy the process too, because there's times I look back on things where I'm like, man, that was so much fun. Or like, that was so cool. And like, there's were times where I was too stressed and miserable at the time to like, to really give, give that its due. Yeah. And then there were other times where I was very cognizant of how cool it was that we were in that situation. And I look back on those times the most fondly. Like, oh, that's, that was cool, you know? Yeah. And I think, so I think it's important to like, you know, not necessarily like lie to yourself and big up yourself well, all yeah, the time. Like just, you the know. The first day you start personal training, like, yeah, you might not be able to handle a guy like Ray Hart. Yeah, who's no, gonna definitely. challenge you. Or like, yeah, training these high level athletes, like yeah. Tinoco and mm -hmm. Faith Lupez, like, yeah, because you might not have been comfortable with the knowledge that you had. And now that you've been in the trenches long enough, you know, yeah, what, going to take to get them to be better right exactly yeah and, and yeah and when you have like and when you have something to provide and help somebody and you know it's going to help them you're excited to yeah you know? exactly it goes back to the part too like where you were saying it, like how can i impact people like that's kind of in a lot of ways been what i think about lately is that people ask me all the time is it marcelo's or what else different things they can do xyz like people even and i don't encourage this necessarily there's been people online that have like watched either videos or blogs I wrote and they found my number and have called me. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, like, you know, I talk to them and I'm like, well, how can I like help the biggest number of people? Like I'm only one person. I can't sit and take like hour yeah, yeah. phone calls with everybody. But like, and that's, that's that, like, I don't know yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's, this is not me like big up in myself at all. It's just how can I help people like with like the different things that they go through and wanting to train jujitsu because they like it so much and they don't want to, like they're afraid. These are just normal people, or yeah. they're like just trying to train, and that's why I've really tried to reinvest in like in content creation now, like making videos that I actually think. Are and you came out with the program, right? right. Like, yeah, training, mm -hmm. training for jiu-jitsu, right? Yeah. So now people can buy like a program that you came up with, and I'm sure you are involved with it. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, yeah, you know, like they can buy training with you that like right at a lower cost. Exactly. You, you can follow along at home. Yeah. And, yeah. Actually, I just. And like we're finally at, I don't think I've officially made the announcement, but like I can't do it now. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do it right today. Yeah. If you've ever been to fightcampconditioning.com, they make they're like some of the best, they put out some of the best programs for fighters in any combat sport. Like they they, they take like the best strength coaches, some of the best coaches that um, can help you with those things that aren't specifically fighting. And whether it's conditioning for wrestling, jujitsu, MMA, boxing, whatever, and they approached me uh, end of last year and asked if I wanted to do a jiu-jitsu one for their website. So uh, we just finished doing yeah. all the filming and everything. Thank you, yeah. So we're doing, that's gonna be released in March, early March, because I told them I wanna do it and I wanna do it in time for Worlds. So for everybody who wants to take three months to train for Worlds, I wanna have it so out So it's a three-month three month program? It's a three-month like, program. At the end, that's when you should be peaking. Exactly, yeah, you should be at your strongest. So it's a... I remember you posting some stuff with Mateus, like mm -hmm. like some pictures like of him, and then like as he started cutting weight and stuff. Yeah. Did you help with the nutrition too, or...? Yeah, and when people... Not that program, 
this program that I'm releasing is is just for strength training. It's okay. got a lot of video demos, slides, so we really tried to go overboard and to make sure people, it's not just me like, hey, this is a squat. This is me trying to explain things to you. Like, okay. this is how you, as close as we could get to be personal training without me being there or like taking calls or emails. Like, just a lot of video files. Uh, it'll be something you log into and, and, and oh, do via their website and whatnot. So, it'll, I'm really excited about it. It'll be, it'll be really cool. So, um, when, I'll obviously post more about that stuff when it's awesome. closer. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Like, yeah. Opportunity comes. Right, yeah, exactly. And, and that's what I was looking at like, when, when he asked me, because I've known the guy for a while who runs the site. And I think that's why like, I agreed to, to come and meet with you and talk with you. Mm -hmm. Because like, every time I've seen you or spoken to you or Marcel, you've always been like, such a great guy and like, oh, kind you. and you know, like, happy. And, oh, I appreciate and, you know, that. I've always had great conversations. So I, mean, I think that like, mm -hmm. is attractive. You know? Yeah. Like, Right, yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, I try, I was like, I don't know, I'm, like I said, I'm generally pretty happy, I like the, I like being around everybody there, and you know, so, yeah, definitely. But for your question about Mateus specifically, um, when when I'm working with someone that close, I do help a lot with the nutrition, uh, especially when it comes to like combat athletes when they're cutting weight, uh, because like, there's so many bad ways to cut weight. Well, that's the thing, I think there's, so. I think there's so many different approaches, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I'd like, love to get your take on it. Like, yeah, so Mateus's was interesting because do you do uh, it fast? Do you do like macro, micro? Do you do keto? Do you do paleo? Do yeah. You, like, so well, the, the, the it, it yeah it depends on the person really. Um, but most of the time, if somebody has to do something acute, like they have very uh, strict goals, as in like I have to be on weight on X date, or even someone who doesn't have to be on weight but wants to look a certain way or like needs, wants to gain a certain amount of muscle, like if they have a photo shoot or something like that. Those people, for me, the way tried and true that works for me is having them count their macros. So I will always figure out, we'll always like go that route. Okay. Now inside of that, I'm pretty open to what people's dietary preferences are, just as long as we can kind of hit some of those macros, uh, as long as um, it's healthy food, as long as it's not like garbage or yeah. you know, whatever. Um, but uh, that's the main way, like with Mateus and like combat athletes, it, it, that particular weight cut, he had a uh, 24 hour weight in like the UFC would. Oh, so um, then you can kind of water from Yeah, him. so I basically did it exactly the way you would do a UFC fighter with him, is that I, we dialed it down to, he had to be, weigh, he had to weigh with the Gion 168. So I think, yeah, uh, yeah he's a big dude, yeah, he started at 193. And, you know, I asked him, I was like, you want me to help you with this? I was like, I've got some experience with weight cuts I can help you. And he was like, he's like, oh, I think I got it, and whatever. And then about 10 days later, he came in, he's like, I don't got it. He's like, can you help me with this? And I was like, yeah, I got it, don't worry. So did you do the macros with him? And yeah, him so I just, down so he... I gave him a schedule, I gave him, both him and his wife actually, I gave him the schedule, because that's another thing, like a coaching thing. If you're gonna work with athletes or people who make a living from their body and they're married, get the spouse on board, because like, you're. Like the other ones cooking, the other ones yeah, or even if they're not them accountable, exactly. Even if they're not the ones that cook and do whatever, it's they're the one that that's like the person you see when you wake up when you come home. It's yeah. like you know you want it's a team effort. And yeah, they're, they're part of the team. You and you yeah, to, like, never forget that that they're part of the team too. So like that's why I always make a point of including them and, and awesome. in meeting them. His wife's like, great. Yeah, yeah, no, she is definitely and. Uh, we and so like I was like this is the schedule this is how you weigh your food this is how you do everything I mean to his credit like he picked it right up because some people like I have like really smart people come in here and they're like wait how do I do this but Matei I was a little like is he gonna is, hey, I know he hasn't done this before but he came in and he was even coming up with his own recipes and stuff like that and I was like it worked and Matei is a smart guy he, he is he, and he, he's uh he's another one that has like an open mind yeah he's exactly like, he wants to learn he wants to be the best and so. Mm -hmm. He's open to it. Yeah, know, definitely. Know. And he, we kind of, he's disciplined if it's like aligned with his goals, right? Like exactly. He wanted to be there, he wanted to win. And yeah, he can turn it on and off. So, like, when he would, he was there, he wanted to win, he was locked in, dialed in. And then he also knows when to turn it off, too. Like, you know, it didn't go his way at that Spider Korea tournament, but yeah. like, he was able to pull the positives out of it and say, all right, well, it's back to training, but I have a few things I need to take care of right now, priority wise. And then come back to this intense type of training for the next one, you know? Yeah. So it's like a very mature point of view for it, which I appreciate as well. Um, but yeah, so we, that, that was a, that was a good cut. He started like at 
three, we got them down. The, the magic territory, like it was like one seventy two ish, and before um, the water cut. Before the water cut, yeah. And uh, so the methods I use are kind of macro. Yeah, macro diet, and then the water cut. I hate water cuts. Like I never. I mean, yeah. you have. It's just kind of the evil of like twenty four hour weigh ins. Like it's what people do. Yeah. But um, I use a lot of uh, stand efforting and vertical diet. So it's uh, he's a. He's a famous bodybuilder, and, and yeah, definitely, he's a famous bodybuilder, and again, some lifelong learner, good as big these, like, he got into bodybuilding late, he became a professional bodybuilder late in life, like, I think he was 40 or in his 40s, became a professional powerlifter after that, and, like, broke all these crazy world records as a powerlifter, and not only did he, he did it in his 40s, he also did it in federations where guys would, like, rap, this is, like, something I didn't realize until, like, maybe, like, a year ago, like, if you wrap your knees and you, there's certain techniques, you can add like another 20 pounds to the bar. Like you can, like, you, it's, it makes it so hard to flex your knee that you pop out of it. So it, it gives you a little bit of a boost. And that's illegal in a lot of federations. He did it in a federation that allowed it and he did it raw, like didn't use those. So like there, he was breaking world records that were probably set by guys who were like doing it. Yeah, yeah. so cool. like, it's, but it, he's a like, now he doesn't do that competitively anymore. He's obsessed with coaching. He, uh, you know, has coached a lot of athletes in all different sports, um, got into strong, like coaching strong men. So like Hathor Bjornsson, the mountain was one of his clients. And then he's a fan of fight sports and he like went and learned from George Lockhart and went and uh, and and already had this like very good diet that like he put out this great book this great guide and um, you know so I use I have been using that on myself for the past few years like I've never felt better you know just keep getting stronger Same and just feel good yeah definitely I will and then I reached out to him when Mateus's cut was like at the end and it went perfect like went to Noko and then and giving me the heads up from Korea that he made weight and everything I was like all right good it worked and I just reached out to Stan I didn't know him we have a lot of mutual friends like direct friends but we had never met directly and um, he was like oh my god that's fucking amazing he like reposted that and we exchanged some messages and you know it was, yeah, it was great. great yeah I think it's awesome when you seek out advice from people are like kind of strangers that could be mentors mm -hmm. and I was just like at a recent connect group and the pastor was in there one of the pastors from the campus right right and we were like sitting around talking and he, he said yeah one of the mentors was this book that we were all reading like mm -hmm. a while back and the guy's a famous author right and he goes you know I reached out to him like a few years back right and I just sent him a message out of the blue seeing if like he had like 30 minutes for coffee. The guy lived down in DC. Uh -huh. Like not expecting a response or anything. Right. And he ended up, the guy was like, yeah, sure, I'd love. And he ended up going down, having like like four hour conversation mm -hmm. with him, coffee. Learned so much. And now they're like super close. Oh, that's awesome. And they have conversations all the time. And he's yeah. like, this famous author that like mentors him. Right. So I think that's pretty cool. Like I think, yeah, you know, you'd be surprised that people that are like a high or that you look up to, mm -hmm. like, they would appreciate, like, you know, yeah. people to reach out to them and take them on as mentors or help them or right. like, give out information. But I think once you get to a certain level, mm -hmm. like, you've always had the passion to want to help people. Right. And when you see that someone's, like, passionate about it and they want to learn, you're just like, all right, yeah. Like, yeah. I'll help you. Like, cool. Right. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And it's like, we live in the best it's time. It's pretty cool. I feel like everyone that you said that you learned from mm -hmm. is pretty, like, high level. Yeah, I, I like it all came off of like you just kind of having the connection mm -hmm. and like kind of reaching out or meeting them at some point and like yeah, no, it kind of grew organically and you, you got to be in like some pretty cool places and learn from some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it's like it never. I always kind of looked at it like it never hurts to ask, and then you just whatever happens from there happens, and it's yeah. and you can get yourself in some really cool situations just by you know you know being like respectful, obviously, but just. Like this is the best time ever. I feel like to be able to be connected to people because it's so easy to reach out. Like you don't have to like send letters. You have emails and Instagram and all these other things. So it's very direct. And you know that was something I learned from Steve was that you can reach out to people. Um, like because that was how he learned, and he did it in a much harder time where he had to like write letters, look up phone numbers, leave messages, and play phone tag. And then like figure out like okay we'll meet at this fitness conference and then like you get to meet these really cool people yeah it's meant to be yeah. it'll happen exactly so for me it was it's just 
yeah, I just am like, who do I think might be helpful? And I'll try to like read their stuff. Like, and if if you if people are listening and like want to do that approach, the one thing I would say is like, you know, do your homework. Like, I always, whenever I would reach out to these folks, would be like, if they had books, I went and read them. If they had websites, I tried to consume everything I could on the website to learn about them, so that you're not like asking them to like repeat themselves. Like, so you can actually like like in Stan's case, I learned everything I needed to like know from him just from what he wrote and just was always entertained by like his YouTube videos and whatnot. And like, I never wanted anything out of the guy. I just wanted to show him like, hey, like your stuff, I know you know your stuff works, but like here, this is a success story. And then was able to slowly build, you know, off of that. And so, yeah, so it's like, there's like, I want to show them respect for their time obviously too. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, but uh, that's cool. But yeah, but I know I've kept you for a while, so let me, uh, yeah. if we can wrap it up. So uh, is there anything, any, any, the last parting words, things you want to announce, promote or anything like that? No, I mean, sweet. Yeah, that's about it. No, definitely. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I like coming out here and doing this and I feel like, you know, we like mine. So definitely, yeah. it was a great conversation. And yeah, you know, I'm looking to kind of open, start a podcast down the road. Yeah. For like entrepreneurs and people that are trying to do multiple things at once. And like I was saying before, like how do they fit it in? Mm -hmm. And like how do they focus on just like being good at all these different things and thriving and yeah, you know, and having a healthy marriage, right? Because, yeah. Or relationship or friendships. Or right. Whatever, because exactly. It's tough when you're dealing with so much, and then your dream, you come home. And the last thing you want to do is like ask your spouse how her day was. Yeah, yeah, right? like, exactly. Yeah, you're like, oh man, I just poured out so much into training. I poured out so much into like business, right. and and I've heard from like multiple friends who've like had, you know, bad marriages or yeah. marriage ending because they would just work so hard and they'd come home and they wouldn't have time for their spouse. Right, exactly. You know? mm -hmm. So I, another book I recommend. So I recommended the um, morning, the miracle morning. Miracle morning. Yeah, and another one. For relationships, I've recommended the five law witnesses. Mm, yes, I've heard that. I don't know if you've heard of that, but yeah, you know, if people are in a, in a relationship or in a marriage, I, I really highly recommend that because yeah. everyone's love language is different, right? And so, yeah, you, know, you, you kind of find out what your spouse responds better to, right? So, like, some don't respond well to you giving them a gift, right? It's more of like affection, right? Right. Guys love well, touch. Like, I love. You know, we're guys, we want sex. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> we don't want affirmation, like we want to know like we're the men, like right. yeah, we're awesome, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's funny, like and women might not know like that that's what we need all the time. Right. You know, so it's yeah, a communication yeah. thing. Right. But it's like I think that works really well. So. Nice. No, oh, thanks for the that's all about, thanks for No, no, please. No, it's all part of it. It's all relevant. No, definitely. And when you when you start that podcast, come back. Have another conversation, yeah, or you're, you're welcome anytime, obviously. Awesome, yeah. yeah we'll, we'll announce it too. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Hopefully, that camera's still running. <laughs> cool, thanks, man. Take thanks, care, man. appreciate it. Thanks.